You're sitting in an oncologist's office. Someone you care about was just diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer. The doctor leans forward with what seems like good news. 20 years ago, the 5-year survival rate for stage 2 breast cancer was 78%. Today, it's 93%. We've made incredible progress. The treatments are working. They have excellent odds. You feel relief wash over you. Science is winning. Medicine is advancing. Everything is going to be okay. But here's what the doctor didn't tell you, and maybe doesn't even know themselves. Those survival rates improved dramatically, but patients aren't actually living any longer. The cancer treatments didn't get better. The definitions changed. And that change created a statistical illusion so powerful, so pervasive, that it's shaped billions of dollars in research funding, influenced which treatments doctors prescribe, and given false hope to millions of families. This isn't a conspiracy. It's not medical malpractice. It's something far more insidious. Mathematics weaponized by good intentions. It has a name, the Will Rogers Phenomenon. And once you understand it, you'll never trust a medical statistic the same way again. Will Rogers was one of America's most beloved comedians in the 1930s. He had this famous joke about the Dust Bowl migration. When the Okies left Oklahoma and moved to California, they raised the average intelligence of both states. Everyone laughed. It's a classic double insult. Okies are dumb. Californians are dumber. But buried in that joke is a mathematical truth that wouldn't be recognized for another 50 years. Here's the setup. Imagine Oklahoma's average IQ is 100. California's average IQ is 95. Now, an Oklahoman with an IQ of 98 moves to California. What happens? Oklahoma's average goes up because you remove someone below their average. California's average also goes up because you added someone above their average. Both states got smarter, but nobody actually got smarter. You just moved a person from one group to another. Will Rogers never knew his joke would become a medical term. He died in 1935 in a plane crash in Alaska. But in 1985, two doctors named Alvin Feinstein and Carolyn Wells were studying something that didn't make sense. Cancer survival rates were improving across the board. Every stage, every type. The numbers looked incredible. Medical journals were celebrating research funding was flowing to the treatments that showed the best survival improvements. But here's what bothered Feinstein and Wells. Patients weren't actually living longer. When you looked at the actual lifespans, how long someone lived from the day they were born to the day they died, that number stayed basically the same. When you looked at mortality rates, how many people per 100,000 were dying of cancer, those rates were barely budging. So how were survival rates going up if people weren't surviving longer? They realized the definitions of cancer stages had changed, and better detection technology was finding cancer earlier. These two changes had created a Will Rogers effect. Let me show you exactly how this works. Pay attention, because this is the trick that's been fooling doctors, patients, and medical researchers for decades. Let's say we're in 1970. We have two groups of people, healthy people. Average remaining lifespan, 30 years. Breast cancer patients. Average survival time from diagnosis, five years. Now it's 1990. Medical imaging has improved dramatically. We have better CT scans, better MRIS, better microscopic analysis. We can detect cancer earlier and more precisely than ever before, so we start screening everyone more aggressively. And we find cancer in people who had no idea they were sick, people who felt perfectly fine, people who would have been classified as healthy in 1970 because the old technology couldn't detect their tiny tumors. We move them. We reclassify them. From the healthy group to the cancer patient group, we're being more accurate, right? We're using better science. Here's what happens to the numbers, and this is where it gets wild. What happens to the healthy group? Their average lifespan goes up. Wait, what? We just discovered some of them have cancer. Shouldn't that make the group look worse? No, because these people weren't actually healthy. They were just misclassified as healthy because our 1970 technology couldn't detect their cancer. They were the unhealthiest people in the healthy group. They were going to die sooner than the truly healthy people. When you remove them from the healthy group, you're left with only the truly healthy people, and truly healthy people live longer. The average lifespan of the healthy group increases. What happens to the cancer patient group? Their average survival time also goes up. These newly detected cancer patients, the ones we just moved from healthy to sick, they're actually the healthiest people in the cancer group. In 1970, they would have lived for years, maybe decades, before their cancer became detectable. Some might have died of something else entirely before the cancer ever caused problems. When you add these healthier patients to the cancer group, you raise the average. The cancer survival rate increases. Both groups got better. 
Both averages went up, but nobody lived any longer. Let's make this concrete with an actual person. Meet Sarah. In 1970, Sarah is 50 years old. She has a tiny cluster of cancer cells in her breast, so small that no test can detect it. She's classified as healthy. She lives her life normally and eventually dies at age 75 of a heart attack. Those cancer cells were there her whole life, growing slowly, but they never caused symptoms and never killed her. Remaining lifespan from age 50, 25 years. Category, healthy. Now let's run Sarah's life again in 1990 with better technology. Sarah is 50 years old. She gets a mammogram as part of routine screening. The new sensitive technology detects those tiny cancer cells that the 1970 equipment would have missed. She's now diagnosed as a stage two breast cancer patient. She gets treated, surgery, maybe chemo, maybe radiation. She lives her life as a cancer survivor, and she still dies at age 75 of a heart attack. Her survival time from cancer diagnosis at age 50, 25 years. Category, cancer patient. Look what just happened. We removed a person who would live 25 more years from the healthy group. The remaining healthy people now have a slightly higher average lifespan because we removed one of the people who was going to die soonest. We added a 25-year survivor to the cancer patient group. This is way longer than the old five-year average, so their average survival time shoots up. Both groups improved. The statistics look miraculous, but Sarah died at exactly the same age in both scenarios. She just spent 25 years labeled as sick instead of healthy. She endured treatments, anxiety, and the psychological burden of being a cancer patient. And she didn't live one day longer. This is the core of the Will Rogers phenomenon in medicine improved detection moves people from the healthy set to the unhealthy set. And here's the kicker. There's a second effect that makes this even more deceptive. When does survival time start counting? From the moment of diagnosis. So even if early detection doesn't help you live longer, it automatically makes your survival time look longer because we started the clock earlier. Let's take a different patient, Jennifer. 1970, Jennifer has aggressive breast cancer. She feels a lump at age 50, gets diagnosed. The treatment doesn't work well. She dies at age 55. Survival time, five years. 1990, Jennifer has the same aggressive breast cancer with the same biology, but now we catch it on a screening mammogram at age 48, two years before she would have felt the lump. The cancer is just as aggressive. The treatment doesn't work any better than it did in 1970. She still dies at age 55. Survival time, seven years. Did she live longer? No, she died at exactly the same age, 55 years old. But her survival time increased by 40%, simply because we started counting two years earlier. The result? By the year 2000, we can stand up and announce, survival rates for breast cancer have improved from 78% to 93%. Modern medicine is winning the war on cancer, and the statistics are technically accurate. People diagnosed with cancer today do survive longer from the point of diagnosis than people diagnosed in 1970. But when you ask the question that actually matters, are people living longer? Are fewer people dying of cancer? The answer is much less impressive. This isn't hypothetical. This has happened with nearly every major cancer. In 1977, the American Joint Committee on Cancer revised their staging criteria for breast cancer survival rates for every stage improved. Articles were published celebrating the advancement. Funding went to the screening programs and treatments that showed the best numbers. But a 2008 study in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute looked at the actual mortality rates. Not survival rates, but how many people died per 100,000 population. For many cancers, the death rate barely moved. Let me give you the real numbers for prostate cancer, because this is where it gets absolutely insane. In 1975, before PSA screening became widespread, about 26,000 men were diagnosed with prostate cancer annually in the U.S. The five-year survival rate was about 69%. By 2010, about 218,000 men were being diagnosed annually, nearly 10 times as many diagnoses. The five-year survival rate, 99%. Holy shit, right? We cured prostate cancer. Survival went from 69% to 99%. That's a miracle. Except the death rate, the actual number of men dying from prostate cancer per 100,000 population only dropped from about 39 to 28. That's good. That's real progress. But it's not a 69% to 99% miracle. It's a 28% reduction in deaths while we increased diagnoses by 840%. What happened? PSA screening detected tons of prostate cancers that would never have killed anyone. 
Slow-growing cancers. Cancers that would have stayed dormant for decades. Cancers the patient would have died with, not from. But now we're diagnosing them, moving these men from healthy to cancer patient, starting the survival clock. And when that 80-year-old man dies at 88 of a heart attack, we get to say, eight-year prostate cancer survivor. The treatment worked. Did it? Or did we just label a healthy man as sick, give him treatments with serious side effects, and take credit when he died of something else? Here's where this gets dark. Because the Will Rogers phenomenon doesn't just create misleading statistics, it creates incentives that can actively harm patients. Imagine you're a hospital administrator. You want to show that your cancer center has the best survival rates in the state. How do you do it? Easy. You aggressively screen. You catch cancers as early as possible, including ones that would never have mattered. You start the survival clock as early as possible. You use the most sensitive tests that will find the tiniest abnormalities. Your survival rates go up. Your hospital gets ranked higher in those best hospitals for cancer care lists. More patients come to you. More insurance money flows in. But you haven't saved a single additional life. You've just gamed the statistics. Here's the really messed up part. Tens of thousands of people have been harmed by this phenomenon, and many don't even know it. There's a condition called DCIS, ductal carcinoma, in situ. It's technically stage zero breast cancer. Abnormal cells in the milk ducts that haven't spread. Before mammography screening became widespread, DCIS was almost never diagnosed. It was found in less than 5% of breast cancer cases, usually by accident during surgery for something else. Now, it accounts for about 20 to 25% of all breast cancer diagnoses. About 60,000 women per year in the U.S. are diagnosed with DCIS. The standard treatment is often surgery, lumpectomy or sometimes mastectomy, plus radiation. Serious, life-altering interventions. But here's what studies have found. Only about 14 to 30% of DCIS cases would ever progress to invasive cancer if left completely untreated. The rest would either stay dormant forever or regress naturally, or grow so slowly that the woman would die of something else first. So we're treating 60,000 women per year, and at least 40,000 of them, probably more, are getting surgery and radiation for a condition that would never have hurt them. They suffer the physical pain of surgery, the side effects of radiation, the psychological trauma of being told, you have cancer, the anxiety of worrying it will come back, the changes to their bodies and self-image, for nothing, for a disease that was never going to kill them. But in the statistics, all 60,000 are cancer survivors. The treatment worked. The five-year survival rate for DCIS is nearly 100%. A woman named Lee, who was diagnosed with DCIS at age 43 later, wrote about her experience. She had a double mastectomy. She went through months of recovery. She struggled with body image, with anxiety, with the psychological weight of being a cancer survivor. Ten years later, she learned that her particular type of DCIS had less than a 5% chance of ever progressing to invasive cancer. She'd had both breasts removed, a devastating, irreversible surgery, to prevent a disease that almost certainly would never have threatened her life. The doctors who treated her weren't malicious. They thought they were saving her life. The statistics said aggressive treatment was the right choice. The guidelines recommended it. But the math was lying, and Lee paid the price. I need to be absolutely clear about something. I'm not saying cancer screening is bad. I'm not saying cancer treatments don't work. Modern oncology has made real advances. Some treatments genuinely save lives. Some screenings catch deadly cancers at stages where they can be cured. But we've built a system where the metrics used to measure success are biased to show improvement even when there isn't any. If this could save someone from unnecessary treatment, share it. If you've ever wondered why cancer statistics seem too good to be true, hit that like button. Subscribe. Because the next time you're in a doctor's office or reading a news article about medical breakthroughs, you'll see the Will Rogers phenomenon everywhere, and you'll know exactly what questions to ask.